Well, good morning. It is good to see you here this morning on this Palm Sunday. Last Palm Sunday, there is nobody here. And uh, so it is good to see people this morning. Glad that you are here. It is a great day to be in God's house. Amen. 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 Well, before we do anything else, I want you to go ahead and stand up. I want you to turn to the person to your right and say, I am glad you're here this morning. And I want you to turn to the person on your left and say, I'm glad you're here. Now find somebody that you haven't greeted and welcome them this morning into somebody. It's great to have you here today. Well, good morning. If you're being standing, join us for a time of worship.
Matthew 21, verses 9 and following, we're told, And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna, the son of David, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. And when he had entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. If they only knew, they only knew what was to happen within that next week. That sacrifice that Christ made. And so this Palm Sunday, we, we celebrate and we shout Hosanna, but we look ahead. We look ahead. We look ahead to the cross and we look ahead to the empty tomb. And we celebrate these things, we contemplate these things together this morning. So it's good for us, it's good for us to be together this morning in God's house. Amen? Amen. 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 Um, as we uh, continue to worship the Lord together this morning, as we prepare to come into this time of prayer, uh, a couple prayer requests from our church family that I want to share with you. I want to uh, be in prayer for John Studebaker. I want to be in prayer for Randy Runkle for God's healing touch on both of these men. And uh, we will remind you again later on this morning, but uh, after the service this morning, we're going to have a special time of prayer uh, for each of them. So, um, but be in prayer for John and for Randy for God's healing touch on them. Uh, this day and this week ahead. Um, also ask that you continue to be in prayer for Justin and Brianna Miller uh, and for their little one. Uh, just uh, be in prayer for this couple and for a healthy, healthy baby, healthy delivery for them in these, in these weeks ahead. So keep them in your prayers as well. And uh, as, we, uh, as we continue to worship the Lord together this morning, the, the altars are open. And we encourage you, if you want to spend some time in prayer, if you want to spend some time in praise, the, the altars are open. We invite you to come. And as the worship team leads us, I want to encourage the children at this time, uh, they can be dismissed to Children's Church out this uh, back exit door. So kids, you can make your way out at this time as well.
come before you. And we are so grateful that, that your desire is for us to come, to come to you and to come as we are. And God, we know that you, you are so good and that you don't leave us as we are or as we were, but God, you, you change us. You make us more like you. We don't have to clean up in advance. You do that. You do that through your grace and through your strength and for your power and for your mighty wisdom. And so God, we thank you. We thank you that we can come to you. We thank you that we can come to you this morning. So God, for those, God, at the altars this morning, for those uh, worshiping from home today, that uh, God, even now are, are sharing, uh, God, requests and petitions and, and praises. God, we uh, pray for every person, God, and, and every request this morning. God, for those that need a physical touch and healing, and we think of we think of John, we think of Randy and others, God, that, uh, God, that just need that healing touch from you. God, we, we entrust all those individuals, all those families, all the situations to you. God, we pray for Justin and Brianna, for this little one, God. Uh, we pray for, for him even now, God, for uh, in the weeks ahead, a, a smooth and, and safe delivery for him and, and for mom. And God, just uh, the, your blessings, God, over this family in these days and weeks ahead. God, we think of others, God, that uh, are recently recovering from surgeries or maybe they have surgeries upcoming. God, we think of those that, uh, God, that just need your strength right now, that are going through a difficult time. And God, we think of those, God, especially this morning, God, uh, in this place uh, who are joining us uh, or, God, that are just uh, heavy on our hearts this morning that, that, that are far from you. God, for those that, that need to be in right relationship with you, and God, what better time than now, what better week than this week, this Easter week, God, for individuals to come into right relationship with you. So Jesus, we pray, God, that you would speak to us uh, and move in this place powerfully this morning as we continue on with the service. God, that you would, you would have your way, and God, that uh, when we leave here this, this day, that we would not, uh, God, that we would not leave you here, but God, uh, we know that you go with us and God, that we would take you with us and that we would be the light that you've called us to be, God, in this community. And God, that you would, God, uh, move in a mighty way this week in our lives and the lives of those around us. So Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your sacrifice. We thank you for salvation. We thank you for freedom. We thank you for grace that we have only in you. So we pray all these things together this morning in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. would encourage you now to take out your bulletin. And if you haven't already, I um, would encourage you to go ahead and tear off that back flap. It um, allows you to mark your attendance with us this morning. Also allows us to uh, partner with you, to connect with you in prayer. We've got a whole team of folks that pray over the prayer request and, and celebrate the praises that are shared um, each and every week. So we encourage you now to take a moment to, to complete that. And then you can leave it in the pew when you exit the sanctuary this morning, or you can put it in one of the baskets at the back next to each one of the exit doors. Uh, but we encourage you to take a moment this morning and complete that. And uh, we're so very glad that you're worshiping with us here this morning, whether it's your first time with us, whether it's been a long time since you've been with us, or whether uh, you've been with us for a long time. Uh, we're glad that you're worshiping with us here this morning. At Sunlight Wesleyan Church, we're about loving people to Jesus. And uh, we're so glad, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning, whether you're here physically, whether you're joining us online. Um, but we're glad, we're glad that you're worshiping with us this morning. A um, couple things coming up in the life of the church uh, that, that are in bulletin that are important to remind you of. So um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, um, directly after the service this morning, we're going to be meeting in the foyer and there's uh, going to be a team of folks to go out and pray at John Studebaker's house and then also pray uh, for Randy Runkle as well. So um, see Donna or just meet with us out there in the foyer at the close of the service this morning. We're going to have that special time of prayer. And uh, the goal is for, um, for us once a month, uh, the prayer team has put together a variety of things, but uh, once a month we're going to have a special time of prayer like this. So we're grateful um, for Donna's leadership and for the opportunity uh, that we have to uh, be a part of that. So I encourage you, if you have some time after church this morning, to make that, uh, make that a priority. Um, also want to remind everyone that the um, kids event uh, this Saturday, information again in the bulletin about that, but the Rise Up With Jesus. So uh, I know the kids are looking forward to that and looking forward to that time together. Um, we could still use some additional candy and some additional help. So um, if you are able to, feel free to reach out to the church office this week. Let Pat know 
And uh, we're looking forward to that event this uh, Saturday morning. Thank you in advance for all those that have already donated, for all those that are helping out with that, uh, with that time this Saturday morning. So um, finally, this would be the uh, part in the service that we normally collect the tithes and offerings as the worship team leads us. Uh, we don't pass the plate anymore, but we do have baskets set up in the back next to each one of the uh, exit doors uh, boxes where you can deposit your tithes and offerings. You're welcome to do that um, during this next worship song. You're welcome to do it at the close of the service this morning. But either way, uh, we are very grateful as a church for your faithful and generous support in the ministries here. We'd, we wouldn't be able to do all these things that we do without your generous support. So thank you again so much for that. Let's pray now over the tithes and offerings. Father God, we, we thank you. We thank you for the privilege of worshiping you together. We thank you for the privilege of hearing your word. We thank you for the privilege of God, being together in fellowship. And we thank you for the privilege of, of giving back. God, uh, through the collection of the tithes and offerings, God, a portion, God, of what you have blessed us with and a reminder, God, that all that we have, all that we have is yours and it's but a gift on loan to us from you. So, God, as the tithes and offerings are collected this morning, God, we pray that you would bless the gift, bless the giver, and God, that you would uh, bless us and empower us as a church to continue to be a light and to be your hands and feet in this community in which you've placed us. We pray in Christ's name, amen.
Well, good morning. It is a great morning. Well, a few of you believe that. But it is. It is a great morning. So glad that you are here. Pastor Lane already mentioned that next Saturday is going to be the kids' event. It's going to be a busy day next Saturday. We've got the kids' event taking place uh, in the morning. Then in the afternoon, there's a family party that's taking place. So that means we need a team of people, a whole bunch of people that can come in Saturday afternoon around 5 o'clock, help us set up for Sunday morning. We have to move tables, chairs, get everything set up so when you get get here at nine o'clock next Sunday morning. Everything is set and ready for breakfast to be served. So at five o'clock next Saturday, if you can help, let us know here at the church office, or if you forget about letting us know, just show up next Saturday at five o'clock because we're going to need a whole bunch of people to help uh, move tables, chairs, and get things set up for Sunday morning. So, so if you can help us, it would be greatly appreciated. But it is a good morning. Good morning to you all. It's great to be with you. It's a joy to be with you today, not only for you that are here in the sanctuary, but for those who are watching us online this morning. Today is the start of Passion Week. A day when we celebrate and commemorate the entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. The road that ultimately awaited him from the beginning of time was now coming to the forefront. Jesus had been telling his disciples about this day, about this trip for a long time, but today it finally became real. The week begins with Jesus approaching the city of Jerusalem, and as he comes to the Mount of Olives, he sent on ahead two disciples into the city to find a donkey for him to ride into town. And he also told them, if anyone asks you, why are you taking that, tell them that the Lord needs it, and you'll be granted permission. And that's exactly what happened. When they brought the donkey back, they placed their coats on it so Jesus could ride into town. And as he approached Jerusalem, he began to weep for the city and the people, and the people of Jerusalem, saying, if you, even you, had only known. I can just almost imagine Jesus on the back of that donkey just crying for the people, crying because they did not know who he was, crying because he did, they did not know what he wanted to do for them. And as Jesus continued into Jerusalem, large crowds gathered around the road, hailing him as the coming hero, shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. It just continued to build and build and build as more people gathered around the road as he came into Jerusalem. The city had an electric feeling because they anticipated for, for Jesus to come in, overthrow the Roman, Roman government to be free. That's what they wanted. That's what they desired. That's what they thought Jesus was going to do. So they were all pumped up. The city was pumped. One little spark and that city would have exploded. Jesus went into the temple. A lot of things happened throughout that week to come up. Jesus went into the temple, threw out the money changers and all of those who had turned a place of worship into a city market. The blind and the lame came to the temple to be around Jesus so they could be healed. Many parables were spoken and Jesus taught many things in that week as people came to hear the great words of Jesus. Jesus prepared to eat the Passover meal with his disciples, all the while knowing that each day brought him closer and closer to the cross. There were so many events that, went, that took place that week that we could focus upon any of them this morning, but I'd like for us to zoom in to an event that took place towards the end of the week. And that is what took place in the garden on the night that Jesus was taken prisoner. And I believe the events of that moment have much for us to learn today. So if you have your scriptures with you, I would encourage you to turn with me to Mark chapter 14. Verses 27 through 40. Mark chapter 14, verses 27 through 40. If you forgot your scriptures this morning, don't worry about that. There's pew Bibles in front of that, uh, in front of you. You can use your electronic devices or you can just follow along on the screen behind me. But that's where we're going to be this morning. Mark chapter 14, verses 27 and through 40. And, it, and as I read this this morning, I'm actually going to be reading it from the New Living Translation this morning. So it may be a little different than what you have in your scriptures, but follow along with us anyway. And this is what it says. 
On the day, Jesus told them, all of you will desert me. For the scripture says, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Peter said to him, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night, before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter declared emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the others vowed the same. They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little farther and fell to the ground. And he prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass, by, pass him by. Abba, Father, he cried out, everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned and found the disciples asleep. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them again and prayed the same prayer as before. And when he returned to them again, he found them sleeping. For they couldn't keep their eyes open and they didn't know what to say. As I review the events of that night, I see a lesson that Jesus wanted the disciples to learn, but I also see a warning that is being sounded for us today as we begin this Passion Week. When you examine the signs of the times and when you study the scriptures, I believe that it is apparent that Jesus is sounding an alarm for his people today. He's calling us to get up, get busy for him. But unfortunately, there are many Christians today who are asleep, spiritually speaking. While they're sleeping, there is an enemy that is viciously attacking the church. And I'd like to say that this is a new problem, but it's not. In fact, this is an issue that is older than the church itself. You see, the Lord's disciples went to sleep at a time when Jesus needed them the most. Jesus had faced troubles and persecution many times in the past. And throughout his life and ministry, Jesus had dealt with opposition from the Pharisees, from the Sadducees, other adversaries. But this night would be the toughest night of his life. 33 years earlier, Jesus had been born into Bethlehem. Now for three years, he had taught with power and authority. And he had fulfilled many prophecies, he performed many miracles, and he changed countless lives. God had a plan to redeem mankind, and this was the night that things would intensify for the Savior. Now earlier in the evening, Jesus and his disciples had celebrated the Passover. Jesus had been teaching these men for over three years, and as they traveled through the Kidron Valley to the Garden of Gethsemane, he continued to teach them. Jesus taught them about heaven, the peace of God, surrendering to the Lord, the coming of the Holy Spirit. And as he approached Gethsemane, Jesus told eight of his disciples to sit down, sit down here for a while. But then he took Peter, James, and John with him and scripture says that he became deeply troubled and distressed. And during this time of great sorrow, he gave his followers a simple, a simple task to obey. He told them to watch and pray. And unfortunately, instead of watching and praying, they fell asleep, not once, but three times. And just as Jesus had some specific instructions for those men that night, he has left some specific instructions for us as well. Before ascending to heaven, Jesus reveal, revealed that he would return for his bride. And until that day comes, there is work to be done for us. Now, Jesus never promised that it was going to be easy, but he did promise to empower us to accomplish what his will was. And we're living in a very dark time in history. 
Christ and his followers are under attack from the enemy like never before. And at a time when the church should be actively watching, working, and praying, it seems that maybe we're sleeping instead. And I believe that Jesus is calling his people to wake up, watch, and pray. And that is the thought that I would like for us to consider today. There are three truths that I would like for us to examine this morning. And the first one is this, coming or trouble is coming. The second one is words are not enough. And the third one is obedience is necessary. So the first one is trouble is coming. In verses 27 and 28, we find these words. On the way, Jesus told them, all of you will desert me. For the scriptures say, God will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I am raised from the dead, I will go ahead of you to Galilee and meet you there. Now we know that the disciples will soon be found sleeping in the garden. But these verses show us that Jesus sounded an alarm before they ever dozed off. Jesus tells his disciples that things are about to get difficult. And he addresses the fact that they are soon going to be scattered. Now, over the last three years, these men had lived an amazing life. I mean, they had witnessed some amazing things while following Jesus. They, they saw him heal people from their diseases. They saw him give sight to the blind. They saw him make the deaf to hear. They saw him give the dumb the ability to speak. They saw him cleanse the lepers. They saw him cast out demons. They even saw him raise people from the dead. And after Jesus fed 5,000 people, they were the ones who picked up the fragments, the remnants that were left over, 12 baskets full of food. These were the same men who were present at the Mount of Transfiguration where they saw Jesus in his glory. And they were the ones who saw Moses and Elijah standing with him. These were the men who heard the voice of God saying, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. Listen to him. Peter, James, and John were all present on that first Palm Sunday. I mean, they were there with Jesus when he rode into the city triumphantly into Jerusalem. They witnessed the people singing, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And earlier that evening, after celebrating the Passover, Jesus placed a towel around his waist and washed the disciples' feet. They had seen a lot of wonderful things. But these men had also experienced some great times in their walk with Christ, but they'd also experienced some difficult times as well. Over the years, they had experienced great opposition and persecution. And now Jesus tells them that there is trouble coming like they have never seen before. And he tells them that they would be scattered and they would abandon him. According to verses 29 through 31, Peter said to him, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. And Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night before the rooster crows twice, you will deny three times that you even know me. No, Peter declared emphatically, even if I have to die with you, I will never deny you. And all the others vowed the same. They all vowed, but we know that that is not what happened just a few hours later. Jesus had been giving the disciples words of warning for some time. In fact, in Matthew 24, verses 6 through 11, Jesus told them, And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. This was just one of many times when Jesus tried to warn the disciples. 
And there are many, many other verses that proclaim the fact that trouble is coming. The question is, do we believe this warning from Jesus? Do we believe this warning that Jesus has provided in his word? Because we live in a day where things are bad and getting worse. Our society is growing increasingly secular. There are constant attacks on the church. Our own government is becoming anti-God. Christians are facing opposition in the U.S. like never before. And that's just here in America. The fact is that Christians are being persecuted all over the world. And it is my belief that the day is coming when those things that are happening overseas to those Christian martyrs, the same thing will happen here in the United States. And you say, I'm not sure that's actually going to take place. How many of you have been following the NCAA tournament? How many of you have been following that Oral Roberts University, a Christian university, was in the final 16 and played yesterday? How many of you are following that the USA Today this past week wrote an editorial saying that Oral Roberts University should be thrown out of the tourney because they are a Christian university and because they have Christian values? And because they have Christian values, they can't possibly be in an NCAA tourney. It's only the beginning. Trouble is coming. Here in America, false religions are seeing their numbers increase by the millions while Christianity seems to be stagnant. Our, our Savior is under attack and it seems that the church is sleeping. Jesus warned Peter, James, and John that trouble was coming, and instead of staying awake and praying, they slept. They abandoned him when he needed them the most. And if we're not careful, we may do the very same thing. We cannot deny the fact that trouble is coming. Because of this, we must watch and pray. As we continue, I would also like us to consider the fact that words are not enough. After Jesus warned his disciples about what would soon take place, they immediately professed their undying love and support for him. Three years traveling with the master and they still could not fully understand completely or listen fully to what he was saying. But let's not be hard on him because some of us have been following Jesus for decades and we still refuse to listen or understand. You would think that Peter would know better, but you would be wrong. In verses 29 through 31, the conversation that took place reveals that Peter boldly professes that even if everyone else is offended, that he would not be. Jesus goes on to reveal to Peter that he would deny him three times before the rooster crows. And Peter says that he would rather die than abandon Jesus. And all the rest of the the disciples echoed, yeah, Peter, we're with you. We're with you, Peter. I believe each one of these men genuinely meant what they said when they said it. But when the time came, that's not what happened. Many people are quick to profess their devotion to Christ. They say they're willing to deny themselves. They say they will forsake all. They say they will follow Christ. They say that they will never abandon Christ. They say that they would never abandon his cause. But when they face circumstances that they could never imagine, they turn away from him. All the disciples professed that they would never leave Christ, but Jesus knew better. The next day as Jesus hung on the cruel cross, John was there with Jesus' mother Mary, but the rest of them were nowhere to be found. Some of them, some of you, some of us have professed devotion to Christ in the past, but somewhere along the line, we left that. And if that's the case, it's time for us to return to him. If if you keep reading, you will find that even though these men failed at that time, they were restored. They were brought back. And it's easy to make a profession in the atmosphere of a church. But it can be difficult to follow through when troubles come. It's easy to make a profession here inside the church sanctuary because it's safe. But when you go out in the world, it's hard 
to keep that because everything outside is not as safe as it is here. And this is not just the case for immature Christians. It's not only new believers that walk away in the face of trouble. Sometimes it's the strongest Christians who turn away. Peter, James, and John were not just disciples. I mean, they were Christ's inner circle. These are the three who were the closest to him. These men were personally chosen, called, and commissioned by Jesus. They were devoted followers who had left everything to follow him. And this text shows us that no one is exempt from failure in the Christian life. But we also see that words are not enough. I know it's an old cliche, but it's one that's still true. It's not enough to talk the talk. Sometime we have to walk the walk. And that leads us to the third truth. So trouble is coming. That's number one. The second one is words are not enough. And the third one is obedience is necessary. In verses 32 through 34, it says, They went to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and Jesus said, Sit here while I go and pray. He took Peter, James, and John with him, and he became deeply troubled and distressed. And he told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And Jesus takes these men to Gethsemane and asks them to do something for him. He asks them to stay here and to keep watch with him. That's it. All Jesus wanted was for them to sit, watch, and pray. Now, that sounds like an easy task, but not that night. Understand that this was a very tough night for the Lord's disciples. Jesus had revealed to them some very shocking news. Jesus had told them that they would all be scattered that night. He revealed that one of them would betray him that night. Peter had been told specifically that he would deny Jesus three times that night. And these things were certainly weighing heavily on their minds. They were exhausted mentally, physically, and emotionally. Instead of watching and praying, Jesus found them sleeping. And while Jesus had asked them to watch and pray, he went on up ahead a little further. And Jesus was in the midst of deep sorrow and great anguish. And in verse 35, he says this. He went on a little farther and fell to the ground. He prayed that if it were possible, the awful hour awaiting him might pass him by. Now, Jesus knew exactly what was about to happen. He knew that, that he would soon become the sacrifice for the sins of the world. And he said, Abba, Father, he cried out. Everything is possible for you. Please take this cup of suffering away from me, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. And then in Luke twenty two forty four, 44, it says this, he prayed, Jesus prayed more fervently, and he was in such great agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. While Jesus was facing such anguish and agony, the disciples had fallen asleep. So Jesus returns to them the first time in verse 37 through 39, and he says, he returned to them and found the disciples asleep. And he said to Peter, Simon, are you asleep? Couldn't you watch me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Jesus then left them again and prayed the same prayer as before. So Jesus came to them and then went back, prayed the same prayer. And then in verse 40, it says, when he returned to them again, he found them sleeping. For they couldn't keep their eyes open and they didn't know what to say. So Peter goes, or so Jesus goes away once again and prays again and come back a third time. And when he returned to them the third time, he said, go ahead and sleep. Have your rest, but no. The time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. After being confronted by Jesus, the disciples fell asleep twice more. And while they were sleeping, Jesus was praying in agony. Something else was going on not too far away at that very moment. Judas Iscariot was meeting with the enemies of Christ because he had agreed to betray Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And after this intense time of prayer, Jesus returns to Peter, James, and John and says, the time has come. 
the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners, and here comes the one who betrays me. And you can almost hear the sadness in Jesus' voice because you know his time is coming near. There was a battle raging in the garden that night, and that battle still rages today. We know that Jesus would go on to defeat Satan at Calvary, and, and Satan's ultimate defeat would come when he's cast into the lake of fire. But today, Satan seeks to destroy all that he can before he meets his end. And he is waging a vicious war as we speak. He's attacking the name of Jesus Christ. He's attacking the church. And while he's attacking, we are napping. And Jesus seeks to wake us up. He told those men to watch and pray. He told them to wake up. And I believe that he's sounding an alarm for the church today. He's calling the church to wake up, watch, and pray. Jesus used the word watch. This means to have an alertness of a guard at night. A night watchman's job is much more difficult than that of a daytime guard. You can spot an intruder from a distance away in the, in the daytime. But the night watchman must be more vigilant in the nighttime hours. We live in a world of darkness and there is evil all around. And our great adversary is looking for any opportunity to cause destruction. In fact, Peter says in 1 Peter 5, 8, stay alert, watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan is looking to attack and he wants to attack the cause of Christ. He wants to attack the church, which means the church as a whole and each individual local church must be on alert. Satan wants to attack the work of devoted Christians and he will attack us as individuals. So we need to pray for ourselves, pray for our families, pray for each other. We may be tired and weary from the fight. We may wanna stop and rest for a little while. We may even wanna hit the snooze button. We may be tempted to let our guard down, but we must remember that Satan is also patient and he's waiting until you take your eyes off the battle. He's waiting for you to doze off, take a little nap, and as soon as you do, he's going to attack. And that is why Jesus is sounding the warning on this last night before he's taken captive. You should wake up, watch, and pray. Can you imagine how Peter must have felt when Jesus came to him and found him sleeping and said, Simon, could you not watch for just one hour? This is the same man who had professed earlier that he would be willing to die before he would abandon Jesus. And before the night was over, he would deny Jesus three times. Like Peter, many of us have made commitments to the Lord as well. We've committed to, to serve him in any way that he would desire. We desire to serve him in the church, but we have not done what we said we would do. Somewhere along the way, our priorities have changed. And serving, in the, serving him, serving the church, praying, do whatever we have told the Lord we would do, just is not that important anymore. I would encourage us to make the decision that today will be the day that you return to the work God has called us to do. It's, to me, it's, it's one of those things where you, when you ask yourself the question, if you knew that this was going to be your last time with someone, what would you tell them? Jesus knew that this was the last time he was going to be with his disciples. He was not going to have an opportunity to teach them anything else from that point on. Why do you think Jesus chose this to teach his disciples at the last moment? Because it's very, very important and vital for the church and for us individually. You see, we may not totally agree with it, but we are in a battle. Satan is trying to take as many Christians out of this world before he's out of this world. And he's battling against each and every one of us. 
And Jesus comes to his disciples that night and he gives them this message, wake up, watch, and pray. And that's the exact same thing that he's telling us today. He's telling each and every one of us, Christians all throughout the world, it's time to wake up. There's a battle going on. You may not see it before you, but there's a battle going on and you better wake up. And you need to watch because there are things happening in our world today that we can see them happen. We can, we can, we can see it take place, but we don't respond. We just watch it happen. And instead of just watching it happen, we need to pray against what is happening. We need to wake up, we need to watch, and we need to pray. Jesus came into Jerusalem that day at the start of Passion Week, and, and he came in, people were screaming and yelling and shouting, Hosanna, the King is here. By the end of the week, all they wanted to do was get rid of him. And at the end of the week, Jesus left his most important message, not only for his disciples, but for us as well. It's time to wake up. It's time to wake up, church. It's time to watch. And it's time to pray. Would you stand with me, please? Lord, we thank you this morning for this this warning that comes from your word, a warning that was delivered by your son, Jesus, as he was getting ready to be taken captive in that Passion Week, a, a week that started with such promise, with so many people just so happy to see him. And by the end of the week, they couldn't wait to get rid of him. And the very last words that he spoke to his disciples wake up, watch, and pray. Because there's all kinds of evil that are going to come into the world. There's all kinds of things that are going to come against you. And the only way to fight against them is to pray. But we'll never know what's coming our way. We'll never know what's coming against us if we don't stay awake. So Lord, help us as a people, help us as your church to wake up. Help us to be alert of what is going on around us. Help us to be alert of what is taking place in our world, the evil that is taking place. And instead of just watching it happen, we see what's going on and we immediately break into action and we begin to pray against it. That's what you're asking us to do. And Lord, I pray that we would just embrace this warning that you are giving us during this Passion Week. And I pray that you will impress upon each and every one of us today, Lord, the importance of doing exactly what Jesus is asking us to do, and that is to pray. Be alert and pray. So, Lord, I pray now that you would just release us with your benediction, with your blessing, Lord, that you would empower each and every one of us to go forward from here today with a, with a renewed vision, a renewed idea, a thing that takes place in our life. And we would leave here today saying, I'm going to wake up. I'm not going to snooze anymore. I'm not going to nap anymore. I'm, I'm going to be awake. I'm going to be alert. I'm going to watch what's going on, and I'm going to pray against it. So, Lord, we just pray that you would be with each and every family here today. Those who are watching us online this morning, may this message also change their lives. And we ask all of these things in your son's name. In the name of Jesus and all of God's children said, amen, amen. amen. You are dismissed. Have a wonderful Passion Week. God bless.